Good morning, Dream City Church. How is everybody today? It is so good to see you guys. I missed you like crazy last week. I hope you guys miss me too. I heard uh, Mr. Clean, I mean, Josh did a great job. I haven't even got to see Josh's bald head yet. I haven't seen Josh, but I heard he did a great job. And uh, thank you so much for all your prayers. And uh, we had a wonderful trip in Africa. It was just so blessed, um, so productive and prosperous. And probably next week I'll have a, a few little pictures and just kind of give you an update on uh, Matumaini Ministries, which is run by our very own um, Dr. Shonda Nike from Dream City Church. Uh, but yeah, I'm just wonderful, incredible. Thank you so much for, for, for praying for us. It just really couldn't have gone any better. And um, today I want to start in Acts chapter 1, verse 8. Uh, if you don't know, Acts is actually a sequel to the book of Luke. So at the end of the book of Luke, uh, Jesus is about to be taken up to heaven and he's saying his final goodbyes and given his last instructions, the great commission, go into all the world, preach the gospel. He's, he's having that conversation with all of his disciples. But he gives them one last instruction. He says, before you go into all the world, first go to Jerusalem and wait in Jerusalem because I'm going to be sending something to you in Jerusalem. And Acts chapter 1 verse 8 is kind of where that story picks up. It says this, but you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes on you and you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem and in Judea and Samaria and to the ends of the earth. Today we're starting a four-part series called Power on Purpose. It's not going to be four Sundays. It's today. It's Wednesday. It's next Sunday and the next Wednesday. So please make plans to be here the next two Wednesday nights as we really take a look at the gifts of the Spirit, the purpose of the Holy Spirit, the baptism of the Holy Spirit. Going to try to be really answering some of those questions for you today. But today I want to start with this very, very important question of who is the Holy Spirit? Who is the Holy Spirit? And I'm going to try my best today. I don't want to get too sidetracked and preach. I really want to try to focus today and really teach you something from God's Word. Because if you can grab a hold of this from God's Word, I'm telling you, church, this can change your life in a massive way. So would you bow your head and just pray with me today before we dive in? Say, Lord Jesus, I love you. Give me ears to hear and a heart to receive because I want to know you better. In Jesus' name, everybody said, amen. You guys okay this morning? Don't get all quiet on me now, man. The, the more you talk, uh, the better I preach and the faster I preach. Come on, do I have a witness? Yeah, there we go. I knew that would get you awake this morning. One of my all-time favorite comedy movies is a Ben Stiller movie called Meet the Parents. Anybody ever seen Meet the Parents? It's so hilarious to me because it's so true. I mean, it's just, it's so realistic. You fall in love with somebody, everything's going great but then you have to meet the family, right? And you work so hard, this very uncomfortable, awkward situation, so desperately you want to make a good first impression, but just like poor little Ben Stiller on Meet the Parents, that was not the case for me whatsoever. Uh, I had kind of known who Erica's parents were, but we started liking each other and we started dating. And the first time that I actually got to meet them, meet them, sat down at a dinner with them. I was leading worship at a conference in Tulsa. It, the, the conference rented out a, a, a big hotel and her parents were at the conference. So after one of the evening services, me and Erica and her parents go to dinner at this nice restaurant at the hotel. And everything's going great. I mean, I'm trying to make a good impression. I'm, I'm letting my boyish good looks and charm do all the work for me. I mean, things are going well. And I take a big drink of water. And at the exact same time that my mouth gets completely full of water, somebody, I don't remember who, said something funny, and I don't remember what. 
But what I do remember is that all that water that was in my mouth went and completely soaked Erica's mom. Like, we're not talking about a few little dribbles, boys and girls. We are talking completely, completely drenched her mom. But uh, this Tuesday, we'll be celebrating 19 years of marriage. So we started off rough, but man. But I think we probably all have some of those family members, if you know what I mean. Some of, those, some of those family members, so, some of those family members that like, you're just a little afraid to invite to things, especially if it's in public, right? I mean, you love them and you care about them, but they just kind of embarrass you a little bit because you absolutely never know what they're going to say or what they're going to do at sometimes some of the most inappropriate times. You know what I'm talking about? Are you thinking about that family member right now that's like, ooh, I love them, but ooh. If you're here this morning and you're sitting there thinking like, I don't think I have one of those people in my family. I got bad news for you, friends. <laughs> it might be you. Eric and I were engaged, and um, we had work past me spitting all over her mom, and uh, she's got some family that's from Florida, and they were coming up for a visit. And um, there's two different types of Florida, if you, if you weren't aware of this. There's like Destin, uh, South Beach, Sarasota, Daytona. I mean, there's like that Florida. And then there's the Florida that's like a little closer to the swamps. And Erica's family's a little closer to the swamps. <laughs> and uh, her uncle... Uh, had a glass eye. He lost his eye at some point. And they make glass eyes that are like really professional. You honestly can't even tell it's a glass eye. He didn't have one of those. <laughs> it was one of those that's like looking the wrong direction the whole time. Like you're trying not to look, but oh my gosh. And he talked just like the, the equipment manager from the water boy. I mean like, and uh, so we had some neat conversations. He invited me to come to Florida and hunt alligators with him. I was busy. I couldn't make it. <laughs> he threw out three or four different dates to try to get me to come. It turns out, like, man, my calendar is full forever. That's so weird. I'm not <laughs> going to be able to make it. Um, and as if that wasn't bad enough, uh, he asked me if I would like to see something. I cautiously said, sure. Uh, at which point he brought his two sons into the living room. This is a true story. They're both probably eight, nine, ten, in that range somewhere. Uh, one of them's names was, was Littles. I remember that. I can't remember the other one's name. Maybe Skittles. Littles and Skittles. And before I knew what was happening, he says, all right, boys. He claps his hands. And these two little kids are fist fighting, <laughs> throwing punches, hitting each other in the face. And to my horror, the mom and dad, like, it's the Jerry Springer show. They're, they're hooping and hollering and cheering them on. And, like, I cannot believe. And poor Erica, we get to the car. We're engaged. And she says, listen, if you want to break up with me, I totally understand. <laughs> like, I, to I totally get it. I said, no, baby, it's fine. Like, I got relatives, too, from Wilburton. And uh, <laughs> we all have those family members. Sadly enough, though, uh, I think that's how the church treats the Holy Spirit so often. Truly, uh, we really don't like to talk about him very much because it makes people uncomfortable, right? And it just makes people feel awkward. And yes, we, we acknowledge the Holy Spirit, but we just kind of like to keep him in the background a little bit. Uh, so I, I want to set the record straight today, church, if that's all right with you, with who I think is the most misrepresented part of your Christian life, the Holy Spirit. Can I tell you this morning that the Holy Spirit is not a ghost? Woo! He, he's, he's not scary. He's not some mystical force making people do and say weird things. It's not who he is. 
I've, I've been in ministry my entire adult life, 24 years I've, I've been in ministry. And listen to me, I've, I've learned this for sure. Weird people are going to say and do weird things with or without the Holy Spirit. You, you know what I'm saying? I mean, with or with, weird people are going to do weird things. So please don't let uh, a bad experience with a weird person or a bad experience with a weird church uh, taint your view of what is one of the most vital parts of your Christian life. Because the Holy Spirit is a person. He's a person. The Holy Spirit is part of the Trinity, which that means that the Holy Spirit is God. He's just as much God as God the Father is or God the Son, Jesus. He's, he's just as much part. He, he's not so much scary that we got to keep him in the back room. Like, he's part of the Trinity. And I know that the Trinity can be a kind of a weird concept to wrap your mind around. But think about the Trinity like this. Think about the Trinity as an egg. There are three very distinct parts to an egg. There's the shell, there's the white, and there's the, the yolk. Three very different parts, but they all make up one egg. Or you can think about the Holy Spirit like water, right? Three different forms to water. There's liquid, there's solid, there's also vapor or gas. Three very different forms but it's still all water, it's still all H2O. So we have God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit. So we don't serve three different gods, we're not polytheistic followers, we're, we have one God, but that one God has three very different and distinct parts that we call the Trinity. Now would it surprise you to know this morning that the word Trinity is not even in your Bible. It's not in your Bible. And people that don't believe in the Trinity, that's their, always their first rebuttal. Like, that word's not even in the Bible, Pastor. What do you mean? That's, not, that's, not, that's a false doctrine. And yes, it's true, that word's not in the Bible. But the concept of the Trinity is absolutely in the Bible. And you actually don't have to look very far at all to find this concept. It's in the very beginning. Genesis chapter 1-1, one, one, like he, he starts with it. It's, it's a precedence. It's something very important that you need to understand. Genesis 1-1 one, one says it like this. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. Well, the Old Testament was written in Hebrew, and this Hebrew word for God is Elohim. Elohim is a Hebrew word that is a plural word, that means God's, but it has a singular meaning. So from the very first verse in the Bible, God wants you to know that plurally God's created the heavens and the earth. It's a plural word, but it's a singular meaning. Some of you are looking at me very confused. Like, what does that mean, a plural word, singular meaning? Well, we don't really have it much anymore. They, they have shots for, for younger kids. But if you're my age or older, when you were growing up, you got to enjoy something called the chicken pox. The chicken pox. Now, when you had the chicken pox, did you just have one little red bump on your body? Oh, no, I was covered in those babies from head to toe. I was four or five years old, but I remember. So it's a plural word but it has a singular meaning. There wasn't just one pox, there was pox all over you, but we still just call it the chicken pox. Plural word, singular meaning. Elohim, plural word with a singular meaning. If you skip down just 25 verses in the same chapter, God reiterates this principle. He really wants you to grab a hold of this principle. Now watch this. Then God said, let us. That's a, that's a plural word. That's more than one, right? Let us make mankind in our image. That's another plural word. And in our 
likeness, plural. From the very first chapter in the Bible, he wants you to know that there is three parts. There's a trinity. Well, Mark, that's Old Testament, and I've read Leviticus, and that's weird. So why don't you give me a little something from the New Testament so I can know that this is sound doctrine. You got it, dude. I'm happy to do that for you. John chapter 14. Here we go. This is Jesus talking, all right? This is his last real conversation with his disciples. Man, he's pouring out his heart to them. He's, he's giving them all they need to know before he's crucified. Here we go. And I, who's I in this conversation? Jesus. And I, Jesus is here with his disciples, am going to ask the Father. Speaking of somebody somewhere else, God's in heaven. I will ask the Father, and he will give you another advocate to help you and be with you forever. They call him the spirit of truth. So just to make sure you're tracking with me this morning, Jesus was on earth talking to his disciples. He was praying to his father who was in heaven, telling them that he is going to send another advocate, the Holy Spirit. In that one verse, we can clearly see that there are three different parts of the Godhead, the Trinity. So the word's not in the Bible, but the concept is absolutely all, I could, I could give you more and more examples. I've studied what the Pentecostal charismatics teach about the Holy Spirit. I lived in, I lived in that. And uh, I can tell you some stories about some weird people doing some weird things. You don't have enough time, I promise. I've studied what the Southern Baptists believe about the, the Holy Spirit and the way they teach him. I've studied with the Methodists and with the Catholics, and I've extensively studied. I think it's one of the most beautiful things about Dream City Church is that people from all denominations, from all walks of life, from all social statuses come under one roof, but it still feels like family. I mean, we're the family of God. It's, it's beautiful. And if you were to ask 20 people the same question, you might get 20 different answers, and that's okay. We don't have to all agree on everything. Let me ask you this about people that have been married like me 19 years or longer. You've had a successful, happy, healthy marriage. Now, do you and your wife agree on 100% of everything that happens? Do I hear a 75%? <laughs> going once, going twice. Do I hear a 60? I mean, there's so many things that Eric and I don't agree on. We're as different as two human beings could ever be. We see the world through very different perspectives, but we love each other. And God brought us together, and we work successfully together. It's such a fallacy to think that you have to agree with everything the exact same way that everyone in your church agrees. No, you don't. As long as we can agree on some of the main things, then that's all. Man, we can work together. We, we've been working together for five and a half years. The Lord's done some beautiful things. So I've studied this and I've studied that and I've studied that and then I had this epiphany, maybe, just maybe, I should check and see what Jesus had to say about the Holy Spirit. I think he's kind of a, an authority on the matter. So these aren't Mark Hinnon's words. These are the words of Jesus talking about the Holy Spirit. John chapter 16 says this, I tell you the truth, Jesus always tells you that when he wants you to know like he's not lying. And this is pretty important stuff. I tell you the truth, it is better for you that I go away. If I do not go away, the helper will not come to you. If I go, I will send him to you. The words of Jesus. It's better if I go away. Because if I go away, I'm going to send you somebody. Now, I've read this verse several times in my life, and it used to really puzzle me. Like, Jesus, what, do you, what could possibly be better than having Jesus the Messiah here on earth? What could possibly be better than, like, Jesus, what are you talking about? It's better if you go because I'm going to send you somebody. And I think hopefully we can all agree in this room this morning 
Jesus is tops, man. I mean, like, it would be wonderful to have him here, right? But although Jesus was 100% God, he was 100% man. And he had to lay aside some of his God-like traits and characteristics when he was here on earth. He was a man. And as a man, Jesus could only be in one place at one time ministering to one group of people. Like he had some physical limitations. Now, he healed so many people and did so many miracles and cast out demons and set people free. And wow, I mean, John said, if you were to record all of those, you, there's, the books would fill up the whole world. There's not enough room for all that Jesus did. And we celebrate that and we learn from that. But the truth is, is that Jesus only ministered on like this tiny little speck on the map. So as many people that he healed and touched and set free, there were thousands, millions that he wasn't able to reach because he had physical limitations of time and space. But the Holy Spirit doesn't have that. He doesn't. And let me show you how he chooses to work. John chapter 14. Verse 17, this is where we left off just a second ago. He's the spirit of truth. The world cannot receive him. It does not see him or know him. You know him because he lives with you and will be in you. The Holy Spirit who is God? He's not like a mini God, a, a miniature lesser version than the Holy Spirit, who's God, who was from the very beginning, who was there at creation. He's uncreated. He's always been and always will be. That Holy Spirit lives inside of each and every born again believer, friends. So why is it better? Because instead of just having one Jesus in one place at one time ministering to one group of people, now there are millions of believers all over planet Earth who have a really big God living inside of them. There's millions of people all over Earth who are carriers of the Holy Spirit. That's why it's better. That's why it's better. Let me tell you, that's why we have God in our school systems. It's not because, I mean, we have this evil, corrupt government and political system that's taken prayer out of our schools. Track our nation from when they took prayer out of our school to where we are today. You can see the unbelievable decline in our society. They can take prayer out of our schools, but friends, they can't keep God out of our schools. Because when a born again believing teacher walks into that classroom, God just walked in with her. When a born again principal or superintendent or administrator walks into those administration offices, God just walked in with them. You can't keep God out. Wherever your feet go, God's going with you. Man, when you show up to work at the base, guess who else showed up? God showed up at that base. Maybe you work in the medical field. You see families hurting and grieving and going through loss. What am I supposed to do? I don't have anything to offer. Exactly. All you got to do is let the Holy Spirit that's inside of you, let him out. He knows the words to say. He knows how to comfort. He, he knows exactly what their heart needs. When you walk into that hospital room, God walked in with you. The Holy Spirit lives inside of you. When you walk into Walmart as an employee, guess what? God walked into Walmart. And if you work at Walmart, let me encourage you, go find some more believers to also work at Walmart because that place needs some Jesus, man. We need a lot more believers. That's why it's better. Romans 8, 11 says this, the same, the Spirit of God who raised Jesus from the dead on Resurrection Sunday, that Spirit, that power that raised Him from the dead lives in you. Not just preachers, not just teachers or worship leaders. Or We try to make things so spiritual what happens here on this stage. 
Can I tell you the exact same Holy Spirit, the exact same God that lives inside of me lives inside of you. And he has plans and purposes for your life and he needs you to walk in the power that he gave you to walk in. What a different place the world would look like, friends, if we let the Holy Spirit that's inside of us, if we let that person out. What else did Jesus have to say about this? Scary, spooky, holy ghost. Jesus said he didn't want us, he didn't want to leave us alone as orphans. He was worried about you. He didn't want to just up and leave. So he sent a helper, called him a helper. His job is to help us live an overcoming life. He's a helper. Jesus called the Holy Spirit the comforter. How many of you know that life is difficult? Bad things happen to good people every single day. Being a believer doesn't make you immune to hardship. But when hardship comes, you don't have to face it like the rest of the world who don't have hope. You have a comforter living inside you who can walk with you, who can be with you when you grieve and you struggle. He comforts you. God provided that for us. Jesus referred to him as the advocate. An advocate is someone who's not only working with you, someone who is working for you, someone that's working on your behalf. The Holy Spirit is going before you, making a way where there seems to be no way, opening doors that would be impossible to open except for our advocate who goes before us. He's the spirit of truth. That's wonderful news in this godless society. You don't have to be confused. You don't have to live a disillusioned life. There is absolute truth that God has put into motion in this world. And the Holy Spirit can lead you into all truth because he can't lie. He's the spirit of truth. He's not even a little bit confused, friends. It's wonderful. Jesus said that the Holy Spirit will be your teacher. I know sometimes that big book looks intimidating and when you open it up, sometimes it just looks like it's black and white letters on a page. But when you invite the Holy Spirit into your Bible reading, all of a sudden, that book comes alive. All of a sudden, those verses start making sense and things start clicking in your spirit. He's a teacher. He wants you to know the truth. It is his job to teach you the truth. And friend, Jesus calls the Holy Spirit a friend and says that he never leaves you and will always be with you, the Holy Spirit. I don't know about you, but I didn't read anything on that list that I thought it was even remotely weird or scary. Comforter, helper, advocate, spirit of truth, teacher, friend, Nothing weird, nothing even a little bit scary. Why is there so much confusion about the Holy Spirit when actually what the Bible teaches seems to be pretty straightforward and pretty clear? Why the resistance, why the confusion, why, why, when it's so simple? And I want you to consider this morning that maybe, just maybe, that it might be possible that the enemy has worked so hard to bring so much confusion and weirdness and he's worked so hard because he really doesn't want you to know the person of the Holy Spirit. Because he knows that if you ever really develop a relationship with your helper, with your teacher, with your advocate, if you ever really develop a relationship with that person, it changes everything about your life. I'm not going to slap hands on anybody this morning. I'm not going to grab and wiggle your belly. We're not going to have a Jericho march. I just want you to maybe put aside 
your theological, your doctrinal beliefs that you've been taught. And then I came to a really scary and, and difficult realization when I was 21. I had been to Bible school for three years. And at 21 years of age, I had to, to accept this very harsh reality that so much of what I had been taught wasn't right. It wasn't right. And I'd been taught some of these things my whole life. I mean, indoctrinated into me. I still have a little bit of PTSD from some of those experiences. But I had this Holy Spirit realization one day like, just because that's what I was taught, just because that's what some preacher somewhere said very convincingly from behind the pulpit, it doesn't mean it's true. And it doesn't mean that it's right. <laughs> but I had this amazing book called the Bible. And I had this amazing friend called the Holy Spirit that lived inside of me. And I said, okay, Holy Spirit. I quit going to Bible school, but I kept going to Bible school, if you know what I mean. I quit going to classes, I quit wasting a bunch of money, and I started locking myself away in a room with the Bible and the Holy Spirit. And we had Bible school. And I said, all right, Holy Spirit, if you know the truth, I really need to know it. Why don't you do what, you, what, what Jesus said you're supposed to do? Teach me, teach me, teach me. So I understand the complexity of that. I identify with how difficult that realization can be. So I'm, I'm not being pushy and I'm not being, but what I am saying is maybe open up your mind, open up your heart to the possibility that maybe just maybe you don't know everything. Open up your heart to the possibility that maybe just maybe some of the things you were taught weren't exactly correct. And open up your heart and your mind to the truth that you are in desperate need of a relationship with a very real, with a very loving, a very kind person called the Holy Spirit that can change every aspect of your life. Change your marriage, your family, your finances. He, he changes everything. So today, Wednesday, next Sunday, next, that's all I'm asking from you. Open up your heart, open up your mind and say, okay, Holy Spirit, if there's really something that I'm missing and I need it, then I want it. And I'm willing to get just a little bit uncomfortable or step out of my box just a little bit if that's what it really takes. Can I tell you the harsh reality that if you stay in the boat and you stay comfortable, you're never going to grow. And yeah, you're probably going to make heaven. That's wonderful. God has more for your life than just a get out of hell free card. <laughs> he does. He wants you to live the abundant life. He wants you to change the world around you. And if you're gonna do that, then you need the Holy Spirit to empower you to do that. Pray with me this morning as you stand. Lord Jesus, we love you so much. Thank you for being willing to send us the help the assistance, the advocate that we need to learn the truth and to live a victorious, overcoming life. Father, I understand that this is a, can be a struggle, can be a stretch for so many of us. But Holy Spirit, I just ask that as we open our minds and open our hearts to you, that you would teach us truth, that you would show us the areas where we've bought into lies. God, we want to live the abundant life that you paid for us to have. And God, if you intended for us to have it, if you know that we need it, then we want it, Lord. So Holy Spirit, we just say yes this morning. Yes, we're willing to be made willing. Teach us, show us, help us grow. And as we do, Lord, I just thank you that you're gonna do an eternal work in our hearts and our lives. We give you all the praise and all the glory. In the beautiful name of Jesus, everybody said, I love you guys so much. Wednesday night, 7 o'clock, part two of this series. I'll see you guys there. God bless you.